And here we go. Attendees are coming in. GB Tran, Rachel Dukes, Vanessa Garza. Everybody's coming in. This is fantastic. All right. So um, welcome. As the numbers climb fast and furiously here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun. So, so for those of you just joining us, uh, my name is Matt Sillity, and I uh, have the privilege of chairing the California College of the Arts MFA in Comics program. Um, we are nearing the end of our summer session. It's been a very special summer session this year because we've been all online. Um, we're going to be diving into the fall semester, which is just around the corner. Um, in a moment, uh, one of our professors, Justin, is going to say a little bit about our public lecture series, which uh, tonight's event is part of. And I just want to put it out there. We're going to be advertising it a little bit more. But uh, September 4th, we're actually going to be having one final webinar that's going to feature our graduating students. So our students are going to be reading their own comics and performing them uh, virtually for everyone. We can't wait for that to happen. Um, but again, on behalf of uh, CCA's MFA and Comics program, I want to welcome everybody. Whoa, there's a lot. There's a lot of people here. And um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to our, um, our special guest coordinator, who's been putting uh, our speaker series together this summer, one of our fabulous professors, uh, Justin Hall. Hello there, everybody. Um, and just want to thank you for, for coming and checking this out. Um, as Matt said, we, we have this um, program called Comics in the City, and it's uh, basically a, a set of guest lectures that we do um, over the course of the summer uh, session. And um, it's been really fun to coordinate that. And one of the uh, silver linings to this horrible pandemic that we're all part of is that with everything being online with Zoom, uh, we can get people who are not in our physical proximity uh, to be guest lecturers. And, um, so our guest tonight, Steens, is, is I'm very, very excited to, to be able to have her um, uh, talk to everybody. Um, but I also want to introduce uh, Nomi Kane, who will be <laughs> interviewing Steens here. Um, uh, Nomi is a, is a cartoonist and a designer and illustrator. She's worked for people, uh, um, uh, organizations such as The New Yorker, The Nib, Mad Magazine, um, uh, some really uh, august publications. And um, also is a professor with us in our program. And I'm really excited to hear this conversation between her and Steens. Um, the other people that we've had in this uh, guest lecture series that we'll, we'll be putting all this material up on the YouTube channel for CCA. Uh, is, the first one was Carol Tyler. Uh, then we had Jean Yang and then Gilbert Hernandez. And then we're ending here with Steens. So uh, thank you all for, for checking this out. And thank you, Steens and Nomi. So take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. <laughs> hey, everyone. This is so weird to not see people, but be talking to you. But uh, students, I know you're out there. Hi, Ma. I think you're out there. Um, I'm really excited that we get to talk to students tonight because she has a hand in so many different aspects of the comics world. Um, and I think looking at her work and kind of how she got there and um, taking some tips from her for the comics industry is going to be really, really helpful to everybody. So without further ado, because she has a whole presentation planned and I don't want to cut it short, uh, let me introduce you to Steens, um, who is the creator of Heart of the City. Um, she's drawing and writing a comic called SideQuest. She's doing editing for Mad Cave Studios. She's also teaching cartooning at Webster University. Um, so long, long current resume. That's just what you're currently doing. It's true. Awesome. So uh, yeah, take it away, Steens. Okay, cool. So let me open up my uh, PowerPoint, which was open and then I closed it for some reason. <laughs> but I am getting it. So give me one second and then I'll be able to uh, we can admire your really amazing chair while you do that. Yeah, please do. It's, um, it's really cute. <laughs> it looks like it belongs on like the deck of a 60s space show. <laughs> ah, okay, so I'm going to be sharing my screen. So let me know when you can see it. I can see it. Excellent. All right, give it some time to, to wake up. Loading, loading, loading. I don't know why it's taking so long. This is the, the joy of all things remote. Although 
to be fair, when we did in-person uh, guest lectures, there was often a pause in waiting for things to load. It's not perfect okay. yet. Let's try now. We should be good. There we go. Okay, so hello, my name is Steens. I am a cartoonist and editor and educator, and I do a lot of different things. So one of the things I like to talk about usually when I do any sort of um, programming is talk about my trajectory because it kind of weaves in and out. It's not exactly, you know, high school and now I am a professional, you know. So um, I did go to college. I went to Maryville University. Um, I went for illustration and then I dropped out because I was like, this is too expensive. Um, and then I started working in the workforce because, you know, I needed to have a job and a place to live. So I started working at Victoria's Secret, which was really fun. <laughs> It's, you know, it's a, it's a job. Um, but while I was doing this, you know, I was working on fan art and illustrations because that's just the kind of stuff that I like to do. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my art. I just knew that I wanted to do something. Um, so I was, you know, uh, getting my craft to be better. Um, and then around 2011 is when I started working at Star Clipper, which is the local comic book shop here in St. Louis. Um, eventually I became a manager of that shop and while I was there um, I was doing some uh, comics with a local group called Ink and Drink Comics and this local group would put out a anthology every season um, and every season it would be based on a different uh, genre of comics and also titled with drinking so like the uh, romance one was called On the Rocks and then Off the Wagon for the Western. So it was really cool and it was a great opportunity for me to learn about how to work collaboratively, um, how to format my pages for print, how to work with an editor. And while, you know, I was not getting paid for any of this work, it was, you know, it was really great for me to uh, learn about the industry by doing. Um, Eventually, I moved over to working at the St. Louis Public Library, and while I was there, uh, I was the uh, reference librarian for entertainment, literature, and biography, so I built up their graphic novel memoir section. Um, I also helped build their zine library, and while I was doing this, I was working on a project with my uh, co-creator and friend, Ivy Noel Weir. We were going to put out a webcomic called Archive Equality. And Oni Press decided to do open submissions for the first time. So we said to ourselves, you know, why not submit? Because if it doesn't get in, we'll at least put it up online. So there's really no way we can lose here. Um, so we sent it in and it got picked, which was amazing and terrifying all at the same time because then we were like, okay, now we have to draw a graphic novel, which, you know, <laughs> we've never done before. Uh, so it was um, a really like a more of that learning by doing situation. Um, and Archival Quality ended up being really great. It won the Dwayne McDuffie Award for 2019. Um, if you haven't read it, you can get it at like any bookstore, Amazon. Uh, if you see me at a con ever in the future, I will usually have it as well. Um, after I worked at the library, I ended up moving to working at Lion Forge, which is no longer, but it was a publisher uh, based out of St. Louis, and I was working as an editor there. And while I was editing at Lion Forge, I was also finishing archival quality because, you know, it takes forever to finish a book. <laughs> so I had two different jobs while I was working on this book, which is um, wild to think about. Um, but eventually, after working at Lion Forge, I became a freelance editor, professor, and cartoonist. So um, the first thing I did when I went into freelance was editorial. Um, so I was working with individuals, with small publishers, and um, from putting my work out there and doing mini comics, I ended up getting an opportunity to do strip comics, which is where I got the uh, option for um, Heart of the City, which I work on now. So here's my portfolio. We've got a couple of pieces of fan art and my cat's butt and also Justin Hall, who you just saw. He's just like really great to, um, to draw and, and look at. Um, but you know, a lot of people, when they talk to me about what kind of work should they do, should they like stay, stay away from fan art? You know, should it be more 
highbrow editorial stuff. And I always say, draw what you like. Um, and I happen to like fan art. So <laughs> that's what I draw. And, you know, from doing fan art and doing like adaptations of stuff. So like I've got this version of Nancy Drew over here. Um, I did a mini comic with uh, Encyclopedia Brown. I like, I, I'm pretty sure that's what got editors to recognize that I can do adaptations and retellings. And, you know, when I took over Heart of the City, I basically had to do that. You know, I started um, with creating new characters and a new style, but I still took the, um, the heart of the story and it, it is what it is. And that really came from doing what I loved, which is adaptations and, and fan art. Jeans, can I ask you a question here about yes. um, how, you know, I think there are lots of people who create beautiful art at home doodling and, yes. and don't figure out how to get anyone to see it. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel like you were able to get it in front of the right people to open some of those doors for you? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's hard to really place where I got most of my readership because I am very vocal on Twitter. Um, so I talk about things that are important to me. Um, that could be, you know, everything from the injustices in the comics industry to my views on the Puppet Master movies, which I have many of. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I try to, to make my content to be something that people want to look at. And then once they're there, they're like, oh, she's also an artist as well. Maybe they'll stay for that, you know? Um, but also going to conventions really does help. Um, I don't really care for going to conventions. I don't like selling my own work. Like that's why I like working for a publisher because then they can do all of that. I don't have to, <laughs> I don't have to convince people to buy my stuff. But um, I mean, it seriously helps because I was, you know, giving out um, and, and selling my Encyclopedia Brown mini and the uh, mini comic that I wrote and illustrated myself. And all of that is just a really great way to get that visibility. You know, and I think those visibility is really important to me as a, as a creator. Um, so I don't know. I just, I do a lot of different stuff. I put my face out there. I, I have a, a why not attitude, you know? So whether it's Twitter or Instagram or other social media, or if it's putting together um, comics programming and community building programming, you know, I do as much as I can to really, you know, put myself out there, but also to, better the comics industry as a whole. And I think that's just kind of where people knew me from. And then also I draw as well. I don't know, maybe you should ask people. Yeah, who no, I think, I think there's, <laughs> there's definitely something to um, saying yes to every opportunity that comes your way and, yeah. to, and to the social aspect of building community and making connections. Yes. Totally. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of people say that, you know, oh, you got to network to get anywhere. But I think what you have to do is you need to build a community, you know, because networking can feel very cold and very much like I'm just getting to know you so that I can better myself. Meanwhile, building a community means that you're working with someone for the altruistic reasons, you know, you are working with your peers, you're growing together, you're helping each other because when you help someone, they help you. And it's just, that's what comes from building communities. And that's how you get forward in this industry is it's the people that you know, and it's, and it's your team that you build, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, we, got a, we got a question from the peanut gallery here um, yeah. uh, on that note. So I'll ask it now which is uh, we, we've got a student who also does not really enjoy conventions <laughs> and wants to know if you have any kind of tips for, um, you know, em emotionally, mentally getting through them when it's not really your thing. Sure, sure. Um, I, I, I mean, I force myself to do it. So, you know, it's kind of like forcing yourself to do work. It, it's, you think of it as this is a part of my job. You know, I'm not there to, hang out and have fun, although I do hang out and have fun, you know, it's, it's really there because in order for me to move forward in my career and in my industry, I have to do A, B, and C. 
and one of those things just happens to be going to a convention. Um, I'm also incredibly organized. Um, uh, I put together like a list of everything that I'm going to do while I'm at the con. So I'll have like Friday, be at the booth from X amount of time to this time. I have a panel at this time, a panel at this time, eat lunch, walk around, you know, and making sure that I have that schedule helps me with the focus so that I don't feel so overwhelmed by all the people and the options there are for like different things to buy. You know, I just kind of have to get in the right mindset that this is not a convention. This is work you know? Yeah. That helps. <laughs> no, I, think that, I think that answers it really well. Awesome. Um, so when it comes to comics, um, I consider myself a cartoonist and not a writer because anything that I write, I'm going to draw. I don't just write for writing's sake because I don't like it. Um, because I'm not, I don't, I, I don't uh, like to do things that I'm not good at. So, <laughs> you know, why challenge myself? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I did challenge myself and I, I, I made a, a mini comic called Receiving Transmissions, which people loved and I'm, I'm glad that they liked it. But, you know, at that point I was like, I hate this. Um, I need to find a way to do this so that I love it. And I think it's just, you know, telling my own stories about what's going on in my life is something that makes me more happy than creating fictional stories or retellings and like starting new stories. I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, but um, yeah, so I, I do a lot of different kinds of, of comics. Um, but this is Heart of the City. This is the strip comic that I'm working on now. So it was written by Mark Titulli and he had been doing this comic for over 20 years and he finally retired, which honestly do it if you're drawing every day for 20 years you deserve to retire um and they wanted to keep the story going because it does have like a really good premise and, and great bones um but they wanted to update it for a modern audience and so uh sheena wolf who was my editor she reached out to me and she was like what do you think of strip comics and i was like i like reading them <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> um, well, you know, I come from comic books and, and single issue series and graphic novels. So strip comics is a completely different world. You know, it's all comics, but it's a completely different industry. Um, so it, was, it took a whole lot of, of learning to get through it. Um, but one of the things that I definitely wanted to do was to focus on Hart and her friends because a lot of the older story is kind of focused on her mom and her babysitter, which makes sense when you're like six or seven years old because those are the people that you're around. But by the time you're in middle school, you're starting to become your own person. You are hanging out with people that you want to hang out with rather than just people that you are near. And, um, and I think that's like a really important time in all of our lives. And so that's kind of what Heart of the City is um, about. It's about being in middle school and growing up and changing and, and being a goofball and really like having those close friendships. Um, and yeah, I really like Heart of the City. I don't know why I'm like better at writing heart than I am at anything else. Maybe because it's humor and I think I'm funny. <laughs> I think you're funny. I think there's also something really earnest about uh that age right that like sixth grade seventh grade yeah. and it, it I you have such a playful sense of of both writing and drawing that it kind of suits perfectly to that in a lot yeah. of yeah I mean I think of it like whenever I'm thinking of like a strip to do for Heart of the City I don't think about what's the story I want to tell I think about like what's the illustration I want to do and then the story kind of gets built around that um because they're just like, I don't know, I just love building these characters, and I, I hope to do it for 20 years, and then I retire. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is some of the, the work that I've done on Heart of the City. Um, another thing that's interesting about strip comics um, is that I don't color my own work. Um, the only thing that I color are my Sunday strips, so I have an entire color department that actually goes through and, and color, colors my strips, which is another thing to get used to. <laughs> um, but yeah, one of the things I wanted to do with this store was really build out her group of, of friends and also tell different kinds of stories about different kinds of families. Um, so, you know, while Addie Hart's mom is a single mother, you know, you have to ask yourself, well, where's her dad? Is there a story behind there? Maybe, I don't know, maybe you should read Heart of the City in December. Um, <laughs> 
And then, um, you know, with, with Kat, we don't really get to see a lot of her in the earlier um, stories. And I really wanted to uh, do something with like a blended family. You know, you have um, families of different races, but then you also have like stepsisters and half sisters. And there's just like a different um, connection that those relationships are. Um, and then I really liked making um, Charlotte's family. Um, I did name her older sister after my twin sister, Celeste, which, uh, you know, why not? <laughs> if Mark Tatuli can name Dean after his son, I can name this side character after my sister. <laughs> um, yeah, and Leslie and Jackie are, are Charlotte's moms, and I'm really happy that I haven't, like, gotten any, like, hate about having, you know, a, a lesbian family, um, and it's, it's great. It's, it's happy. That's, that's the kind of stories I want to tell, happy, real stories you know um oh and ashley dean's mom is a cartoonist because <laughs> why not <laughs> it's my story <laughs> um here are some of the books that i have been in um i obviously i did archival quality which we talked about dead beats i worked with ivy noel weir again on a story that was a horror story um my first actual like published work outside of ink and drink was in elements fire um so it was, I wrote it and I illustrated it. And I think after I did that, I realized that like, I just can't get into writing, <laughs> at least not like this. Um, the shorter stuff is just my, my cup of tea. Um, I'm also in mine. I did some art for some uh, D&D uh, supplemental books. Uh, I'm in Power and Magic. I did my version of Encyclopedia Brown, which was a story that I had always wanted to do growing up. Um, so when I was freelance, I was like, I got the time now, it's happening, you know? So um, I made that. I also edit, so I edited Rolled and Told, which was a uh, tabletop role-playing um, magazine where you got different stories that you could, or different modules to put into your uh, campaigns. Um, it had 12 issues and it's awesome. You can find the hard covers anywhere. The single issues are a little bit harder to find, but again, if you see me at a convention, I will have them. Um, I did Quincredible. I worked on Witchy, uh, work for a million, which is awesome. It's um, actually a graphic novel adaptation of one of the first uh, lesbian gumshoe detective novels. Um, and it is so, so, so good. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of different kinds of editorial, because why not? I feel like this is a good place for this question we yeah. just got, um, because we've just showcased how many, how many projects you're working on. And yeah. Working on. Um, we've got a question that's, um, how do you balance that, take every opportunity mindset with making sure that you don't get overwhelmed like mm. have time to feel pain yeah well first of all it's really easy to do it when you don't have a um like a, a normie like desk job because that takes up eight whole hours of your day um so now that i'm working freelance i have the opportunity to take on more projects but also i have to think about you know everything that you do this is a quote from a friend by the way, she said, everything that you do is a stepping stone to get where you're going to be in the future, but you do not have to step on every stone to get there. And keeping that in my mind is always a really good way for me to remember to say no to things that I don't think I need to spend my time on, you know, and I'm definitely one of those kinds of people who says yes to a lot of projects because I don't want to miss out on something. But I think it's taken some time to really get into the habit of really thinking, what do I want to spend my time on and what's going to be worthwhile for me to spend my time on? Um, but literally how I do it is, um, well, I, I wake up at eight and I allocate 15 minutes to lay in bed and do nothing. Um, sometimes this is trying to get my cat to stop licking my face because he's basically a dog. Um, and then I have breakfast and I putz around a bit. And then by nine o'clock, I'm in my office and I'm working. And I always do all of my editorial work first because that requires more focus than my drawing. Um, my drawing, because I write so many things ahead of time and it's really just drawing, I don't really have to think as hard as I do as if I'm 
working on a pitch with someone or if I'm reading through a script. So I do all of my editorial first. Um, I get a text from my husband that says, please don't forget to eat. And then I eat. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when I start working on my artwork. So I'm just, I'm very, very organized. And later on, if you want, I can show you my calendar. And while it, it may look overwhelming for some people, it like gives me a sense of calm to actually see it on my calendar. Because in my, my way of thinking is, if it's on the calendar, it's not in my head. And it's not taking up space, you know? So if someone says, hey, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to put X on Monday, Y on Wednesday, Z on Friday. I don't have to think about it until Monday, you know? So it's like, it makes it a lot easier for me to, to think about what I do when I organize it like that. I think that was a second vote for Google Calendar. Everyone mm. remembers me telling you how important yes. that was in class. <laughs> Google Calendar is everything. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the next part of my presentation is talking about pitching and publishing. So I know a lot of the um, uh, attendees are students, and I think it's really important to talk about the kind of things that you're going to need in a pitch. Um, so in this page, I kind of just include some of the things that I pitched. So this one here is a piece of art that I did for SideQuest because it, it follows me and my friend Sam as we talk to you about the history of tabletop role-playing games. So we're like your guides. Um, and then Encyclopedia Brown, I always feel like it's kind of a pitch as well because it shows that I can do my own work. Um, it shows that I can add, um, you know, do adaptations. Um, I did a thing for um, another story that I'm actually gonna redo this page because I look at it now and I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> this lettering is a travesty. Um, but you know, it's, it's fine. Um, and then I'm looking at heart and it, I kind of had to pitch a lot of different things for heart as well. So I think of like everything that I do is kind of a pitch for anything else that I want to do, you know, show people that I, I have the range and I, I can actually do it. Um, but here's a list of things that um, I would recommend to include in the pitch. So first of all, if you're going to pitch a comic, you need to show sequential art. Because if you are an illustrator and you do mostly like editorial illustrations, but you want to do a comic, Editors want to see that you can actually do visual narrative and storytelling through sequential art. Because if you don't show that, that's going to mean it's going to be harder for the editor to kind of walk you through how to make comics. Or they're going to say, well, I don't know if we should take this chance on this artist because we don't know if they can even make a comic, you know, because they're, they're two different, you know, skills. Um, when you're writing your outline for the story, include the whole story. Like it doesn't have to be a 500 page manuscript, but when you do the outline, we need to see the beginning, the middle and the end. And it's important to include the end because why would an editor want to pick up a book if they don't know how it ends? Because then they're going to have to workshop with you. How do we want this book to end? Which is more work on the editorial team. Also, you have to think about they're giving you money to do this book, which means they are giving you money for an ending. You know, so if you want to uh, get this story in the hands of, of uh, a publisher, you have to make sure that you know exactly how the story is going to flow. Um, it also shows that you can do more than an elevator pitch. I feel like anybody can do an elevator pitch. You know, you could be hanging out at a bar and be like, oh, you know, it'd be a cool idea if, 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 if Deadpool was actually like, you know, a Pokemon. And like, if that sounds cool, I guess, but like, how does it work? You know, we've all, we've all sat next to sat next to that guy at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you yeah. can my graphic novel. No, thank you. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Because I guarantee you that doesn't have an ending. Um, <laughs> so yeah, spoil the ending. Um, script. So some people are auteurs. They like to write and illustrate their work. I don't usually. So whenever I'm working on a pitch with somebody, I need my writer to write the script, um, to show that A, you know how to write a script because even though, you know, you may be the one illustrating it, an editor still has to read it. You know, an editor still has to be able to read through and understand, well, how does the story go? So it is important to learn how to script a comic even if you are drawing your own comic. Um, think about what kind of story you wanna tell. I think what's one of the things that really pushes an editor into wanting to pick a story is the story behind the story. You know, if you came up with the story, just like you rolled over in bed and you're like, huh, that'd be kind of cool. Like that's a, an okay story. But if you said something like, you know, I've always 
you know, gone to, you know, apple orchards with my mother. And I always remember how great it is to actually pick apples. And it kind of reminded me of this and reminded me of that. And it's like, that story is what's going to get an editor to think that you're going to put the heart that needs to be in this story. It's not just something you want to do because you want to make money. It's something that it's a story that you want to tell. You want people to reach out and actually feel those feelings that you had when you were writing that story. Um, what kind of publishing are you looking for? That's another really important thing. Um, most people are like, oh, well, I just want to do a comic. Okay, well, do you want to do a graphic novel or do you want to do a single issue series? And if you want to do a single issue series, is it going to be ongoing or is it going to be five issue miniseries? And is it, or is it going to be six issue miniseries? Um, do you want it to be a strip comic? Do you want it to be a, a children's book where it's illustration plus words, you know? So you have to know what you want the finished product to look like because it shows that you know what you're doing, but you also have an, uh, a goal in mind because if you just go in with a, a whisper of an idea, it's kind of hard for the editor to, to take that and pitch it to the people that are going to give you money for it, you know? Um, get an agent. I always say if an editor reaches out to you and says, hey, that looks cool, that means it's time to get an agent. Um, you can even get an agent before that. I had a, an agent reach out to me before I even knew that I wanted to do comics. And I straight up told her that. I was like, this is nice of you to reach out to me. And that's, this is very cool. But I really want to focus on my editorial. I'm finishing a book right now. And I don't even know if I want to keep making comics after this. So thank you. But no, thank you for now. Eventually, I ended up getting a different editor uh, agent, not because I didn't like the first one. It's just, you know, it's, it's all about timing. It's all about what feels good because an agent represents not just your work, but also you. So you want to make sure it's someone that you vibe with. You know, it's not just someone who's going to write your, you know, your contracts and, and get you your money. It's, it's definitely more than that. Um, and if you ever need help getting an agent, go online. Um, there's this website called google.com and uh, you can find a lot of information about agents. <laughs> but also, you know, if you have a friend who has an agent, ask them, you know, what do you like about your agent? Should I reach out to them? You know, so many people are like, oh, there are so many agents to choose from. And to be honest, yes, there are, but there are also not very many that are ones that you really want to focus on too. You want somebody who knows comics because there are some agents that are literary agents they come from prose and they're like i want to get in on this comic business because i see it's hot and popping but then you go to them and you realize that they don't even know the language of comics you know you want somebody who's going to represent your book which means they should be able to represent comics you know so there's a lot to go into agents and it could be a, a whole other presentation to be honest um but definitely keep that on, on your mind when you're you know, getting out into your career um, as agents. We got a question here. Um, this one says, I know for prose publishing, agents and editors want a full script for graphic novel pitches. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend a complete script or a sample of script pages? Sample. Um, the reason why I would never suggest writing a full 300 page script is because that's too much fucking work. Like, I cannot, I would never write that. for no pay, for no pay, no <laughs> way, no way. Like, you, you have to pay me money to write a 300-page script that, 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 what if they don't even take it? You just spent how many months writing this script? No thanks. Um, but, yeah, usually if it comes to graphic novels, it is 15 to 30 pages of sequential art and, uh, for the manuscript, I would say maybe 30 to 60 pages. It really just depends on the publisher as well, because some publishers are totally fine with like, you know, the first part of a story to be written, especially if you already have um, a history of writing comics. Um, but if this is like your first one, it's very possible that they'll want you to write more. You just kind of have to figure out what do you want to do. What I want to do is not write 300 pages for no pay it's not happening um but i'm also established you know so um i wouldn't be surprised if they ask you for a manuscript but really talk with your agent and with the editor why do you need a whole manuscript 
is it okay if I give you the first three chapters and show you that I already know how to write for comics? And here are my examples of comics that I've already written. Because what they're looking for is to show that you know what you're doing. You know, yes, they want to know the story, but they need to know that you actually can execute on a story. And if you show them comics that are very clearly executed, that should be enough. And you should not have to write an entire manuscript. You know, it's more like traditional publishers. So like Scholastic and Macmillan and all of them, they're used to getting manuscripts for prose. But uh, comics publishers, Vault, Image, Aftershock, you know, they're not going to ask for that. They want the pitch, you know, because if it's going to be like an ongoing comic, why would you write it ahead of time? Because you have an editor. The editor is going to want to change stuff, you know? So it, it depends on the publisher. It depends on your agent. Always have that conversation, though. If you don't want to write a 300-page manuscript, you should not have to. I think that's good advice. <laughs> cool. Okay, so next part of my presentation, we're gonna talk about the graphic novel process. So um, as you saw, I do traditional comics, but I also do strip comics. So I'm gonna show both so that you can kind of see the, the vast difference between them. Um, so with the graphic novel, this is for the, uh, the book Dead Beats. Um, so I get my scripts from Ivy. And she has gone through a lot of different kinds of, of ways of writing a script. And, you know, when she was first writing a script for me, it was very much like a screenplay. And I was like, this isn't working, you know, because um, only one action can be in a panel. You know, she can't get up and close the door in panel one. That's not how this works, you know. So it took a lot of back and forth between us to really find a, a good middle ground of what we want the script to be. Um, and aside to that, I am working on an official comic standard script because this back and forth shit should not have to happen. <laughs> you know, there should just be a template. So I'm working on it. Stay tuned. Um, the best when you have it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I will. I will. Um, but yeah, so I get the script and the first thing I do is I thumbnail it out. So these are actually very detailed thumbnails. This is the first time that I, I, I thumbnailed on, uh, digitally before I was doing it on like random sheets of paper. <laughs> um, but it's so much nicer to do it digitally. I don't know why I didn't do it digitally to begin with, to be honest. Um, but it's a great way to see like what space I need for the, captions and for the dialogue and just kind of laying it out. Um, I do that first. Um, I skipped the pencil stage because the pencils and the inks are pretty much exactly the same. The, the difference between these inks is that I played with the gutters and I played with um, the types of borders around each of the panels and that's the kind of, and that it was during inking is when I played with that sort of stuff. Um, I also did not letter this book, we sent it off to a letterer, which is why there's no lettering on this. Um, and then I colored it, and this is where I got into doing some kind of experimental stuff with the, um, the outside edges. The story is about um, sheet music that haunts you. So this, our main character reads sheet music and she gets into this kind of trance where she has to play it over and over and over again. And so I was trying to find a way to put that in there um, you know, with some kind of symbol. And it, so the, the red is supposed to be uh, symbolic for sheet music that creeps into your mind. Okay, the difference between the graphic novel process and the strip process. So the strip process, I actually do three months of comics ahead of time. And so I'm doing, the next time that I do another three month chunk is like next week and I'm kind of not looking forward to it because it's a lot of work. <laughs> but basically what I do is I think about a story that I want to tell. Um, and this story in, in, in this process here is she is going to audition for the school play. So I kind of, I write it out like prose style. I don't make it very beautiful or anything. I just kind of write it out so that I can all see it. And then I start breaking it up by day. So what part of the story happens Monday? What part happens Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so on. But I only do that from Monday through Saturday because Sundays have to be 
slightly different because some newspapers only get Sundays. So you can have it be a part of the story, but it has to be able to stand on its own as well in case you're a newspaper that only gets Sundays. Um, so that's kind of a, a puzzle. And then on top of that, each strip, you only have two inches by six inches. So you have a very limited amount of space. So I try and do around three to four panels. Um, if I do more, I need to get creative with it. But I think my background in traditional comics helps me with this because I'm able to like break panels up in new and interesting ways and kind of play with things that I don't normally see in traditional uh, strip comics. Um, but yes, I write it all out like that. I send it to my editor and she'll go through it and be like, this works, this doesn't work, this is funny, is this funny? I think most of our conversation actually is not, is this funny, but which is funnier? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so then these are actually very detailed um, roughs. I don't do roughs this detailed anymore. This was just what I did when I auditioned for the piece. I was really trying to like make sure that Andrews McNeil knew that I can draw, you know, but I, I it's, it's interesting because they really don't care about that. They know that I can draw. They're more focused on, am I able to put the story in a strip format so that it is got a beginning, middle, and end, it's got a punchline, and it works every single day. So they were really more focused on the script than they were on the actual strips, which was hard for me to get into my head coming from traditional comics where you basically have to prove that you can draw, you know? Uh, so yes, these are the roughs, and then this is how it looks when it is finished. And I put the shading in because I think it looks better when it gets colored. Um, I don't have to, not every person does that, but it's just my style. I like it. Now, Do Sunday. Do you work the same colorist all the time? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, I talked to um, the head of the color department. I have no idea who actually works in the color department or who works on my comic at all. So maybe. <laughs> Not exactly uh, collaborative. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's super weird, especially coming from comics where you're constantly talking to the other person, like, what do you think of this? Or here was my idea when it comes to coloring. I mean, the most that I do is I provide color guides. So if there's a new character, I'll put in the colors of the characters that I want to really specify. Um, or if I want to do something interesting with the colors, I'll put that in a color guide. But for the most part, it's like, here are my strips, take care of it, be careful, you know? Um, and then it's a surprise when you see them. That's yes. so hard <laughs> to imagine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really weird. Um, I mean, for, for a while, I was getting my colors back and some of my characters were getting whitewashed. Mm. Um, and I think that's because of the black cartoonists out there, most of them are doing comics on families and their family is all you see so you don't really think about background characters or like a school of people you know and so with me I'm like well the point of this version of Heart of the City is to be diverse and that's just not diverse in the main characters but with people in the background as well you know um, so I'm very deliberate when it comes to who I'm drawing in the backgrounds as well as who I'm drawing in the foreground. And because of that, I have to put in a color guide so they know that the default is not white, <laughs> you know? And it's just like, I don't know. I, I'm, Andrew's Camille is great. I'm not saying anything bad about the publisher. I'm just saying the strip comics, the way they have been, that's just how they are. You know, they never had to consider drawing people or coloring people that are not white or animals. That's just all there, that's, that's the nature of the industry. So, um, but yeah, after we got through that though, it came, became a lot better. <laughs> um, well, and I think what it takes is people to point it out. I think that's the kind of bias that, you know, yes. it's in the back of people's minds and until someone comes along and says, hey, don't, please don't do that to my artwork. There's, yeah. there's no reason for them to, know that that might be a problem. Exactly, exactly. And it does put a lot of pressure on me because I don't want to seem like, you know, the black woman that's just got fucking problems all the time, you know? And it's like, 
I'm doing this because it's, it's going to be better in the long run. So when another black creator comes around <laughs> eventually <laughs> and, you know, they put all kinds of characters in theirs or even with an, any kind of new character or creator comes around and they have a diverse, you know, cast of characters, they should feel comfortable in knowing that it's not going to be automatically colored white, you know? Yeah, you only change the default if if you demand it. And I exactly. think everyone has to. And 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 it also just doesn't reflect the world if all the background characters are white. Like Exactly. And that's another thing I wanted to do with this comic, because I wanted it to reflect the world as it is. You know, if you're gonna live in Philly, you're gonna have some black friends. That's just all there is to it. <laughs> you know? And so that's what I'm trying to reflect because anytime I talk to anyone about comics or comic strips you know, syndicated comic strips, they asked, you know, did you read these growing up? And I was like, yeah, who didn't? You know, if you grew up and your grandmother or something had a newspaper coming in, the first thing you did was go to the funny pages. That's just the nature of the world we live in. And then they became wrapping paper. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's like, I know that all kinds of people are reading these comics. And because all kinds of people are reading them, the actual comic needs to reflect the readers as well, you know? So I say that in an interview and then people are like, but it doesn't really reflect it considering you're not talking about like coronavirus. I'm like, yeah, cause I don't want to. Like I live coronavirus, I don't know. I think kids are it. thinking enough about coronavirus, <laughs> really. Yeah, it's like, can we just have like a story about like a middle schooler that like thinks that her toast looks like Kristen Chenoweth, like please. <laughs> Oh, we got a question on this from the gallery here. Yes. Um, how, how do you address something like that, like with the colors whitewashing your backgrounds mm. um, without, you know, uh, and still be diplomatic and not, you know, get anyone ruffled? Um, so definitely have like a squad of people that I can send the email to before I hit send. <laughs> Cause I definitely, if I, man, if I sent emails on the first draft, if, what a mistake. Um, yeah, make a couple of drafts first. Um, but just be honest about it. Just be like, here's a problem that I'm having. And here's why it's a problem. And here's what I think it needs to be done. You know, just be very like formulaic about it. Just bam, bam, bam. This is the issue. This is how we need to solve it. And here's why. And that's all you really need to do. I think people get into the habit of, you know, making it an emotional thing and making it about, you know, their feelings. And while that can help, I don't think it's entirely necessary, you know, because this is a business relationship, you know, and this is my artwork. And if I want my artwork to be portrayed in the way that it needs to be portrayed, I need to have that conversation with my editor and it's going to suck. I didn't like having those conversations. It stressed me out because I don't want to do that but I had to, you know? So just think about it as in, you know, I feel like you're not, don't say like, I feel like you're not listening to me or I think it would be nice if, like just be straight up. My characters are getting whitewashed. They're very clearly not white if you look at the illustration. <laughs> and this is the reason why this matters, you know, because I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z. And if you are working with an editor like mine, who's good at their job, and respectful, they're going to hear you and they're going to respond appropriately. And if they don't respond appropriately, then that's not the kind of people you need to be working with, you yeah. know? Absolutely. So, um, we can kind of skip the Sundays. The Sundays are, are wild. They're hard to do. <laughs> you know, we, we just have, they're so, this is just a puzzle. When you're so used to doing two inches by six inches and having the same kind of cadence of joke telling to then do a Sunday where you have all this space. You're like, ah, where do I even begin? So yeah, Sundays can be, be harder. Um, but I like them because I like coloring my own work. You know, it's the one time I should get to actually see like the full work that's by me entirely, you know? Okay. Do we have any questions on the process of making comics before we get into some nitty gritty stuff? Uh, we had one here. Um, about if you are, this was kind of going back to the pitching side of it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a writer, mm -hmm. um, do you need to get an artist attached to your project before you pitch it? Mm. Uh, it depends on the publisher, um, but I don't believe so. 
So when at least when it comes to comic publishers, not usually, but it does help. It helps a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend it, but if you just but if you just don't have it, you don't have it. You know, um, the reason I would recommend it is because when an editor is getting a pitch, the first thing that they do is they're trying to envision what the final product looks like, and if you don't have an artist attached they then have a hard time visualizing what the final product is. And the nature of comics is that it is so very visual that if you don't have an artist attached, then it makes it a lot harder for them to envision it as a comic. They just see it as a story. And anyone can write a story. Anyone can write prose. You know, if you want to do a comic, you have to have a... Uh, a, a melding of the two of, of art and writing and to actually see how that works that's going to make it a lot easier for your book to get picked up because it's less work for the editor and I feel like I keep saying like do this because it's less work for the editor but it's true the editor is going through a lot of pitches and the less work that they have to do on a pitch the easier it is going to be for them to support it and pitch it to the other editorial team so yes and no I say if you have the opportunity and you are working with a few artists, then yes, go in with art, have them do some sample art. If you do not know any artists and you do want to make this comic, try and find an artist. But if you can't find an artist, at least give them a folder of all the different artists that you want to see on this project. Uh, I recommend about four different uh, creators. This way they can get, they can visualize it better because they have an idea now. But if you just come in with a story, it could look like my work or it could look like, uh, what's it, who's another artist? Uh, Jaime Hernandez, two, like two completely different like art styles. And it definitely changes the story depending on the art style. So I would recommend it, but if you don't have it, at least give them some samples to work with. Pay, pay those artists for those sample pages. Oh, though, yeah, absolutely. Them. <laughs> yeah, please pay your artists. <laughs> no, no spec work, guys. Yeah. Any other questions before I move on? Um, we got another one here um, sort of about crowdsource funding and stuff, but I think you're going to come to talking about yeah. that. So let's let's hang on to that one for a minute. Okay. All right. So another thing that I do in my free time, I guess, is I go to schools and I speak on behalf of my local VLAA, which is the Volunteer Lawyers and Accountants for the Arts. If you look up VLA, VLAA or, you know, Accountants for the Arts on like Wikipedia, there's actually a Wikipedia page that shows every single one in each state. So if you're like, where do I find one of these? Go to Wikipedia. The answer is there. Um, but I go there and I teach kids about contracts, taxes, and copyright. And it's like the basic stuff that you kind of have to know if you want to be a working artist and not get screwed over. Um, so we begin with contracts. Always have a contract. Handshake contracts will get you into trouble because if you don't have your entire needs and wants laid out, written down, it's very easy for someone to take advantage of you you know? Um, so where can you get a contract? You can write one yourself. Um, there's this website called google.com uh, <laughs> and you can type in contract template for XYZ and you will find several. Take a couple, Frankenstein them together, and there's your contract. That's what I do. <laughs> um, always think about when you're looking at someone else's contract, what their boilerplate is. Now the boilerplate is stuff that is always going to be in a company's contract. It's stuff that you cannot negotiate on. So you have to make sure that you know what part of this contract is boilerplate and what part is negotiable. Uh, negotiable, negotiable, whatever. Negotiable, right? Now I'm not sure. I don't know either. Words mean nothing. Um, so make sure to ask because if you find out that something in there like we don't pay a kill fee is in their boilerplate, you can't negotiate it, you know? So make sure you ask that. Um, and speaking of negotiation, anyone can negotiate. You do not have to have an agent to negotiate your contract. Um, the kind of things that you should always think about is will you own the work, so the copyright, 
Um, you can negotiate your pay. You can negotiate how many kinds of edits or revisions that you do. Um, all of that stuff you can absolutely talk about. It is A-OK -okay for you to do it. And in fact, most people anticipate you doing that. Um, I thought that people were going to negotiate with my contracts with my editorial services and not really. <laughs> so I kind of was like, are you sure you don't want to negotiate? I mean, it's a good contract. I'm not screwing you over, but you do have the option to ask me questions. Um, so you do, you can do that. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be an agent. You can absolutely negotiate your own contract. Um, copyright, always make sure that that information is in the contract, whether it's going to be your intellectual property or theirs, because there may be times where you have done a work for someone and you want to put it on your website to show the work that you've done. If it's not your intellectual property, you have to ask them first, you know? Um, the difference is if I did, um, you know, a, a comic about a piece of toast that has a mustache and his name is Mustache Toast, like, that's my intellectual property. <laughs> I don't own part of the city. That is not my intellectual property. That is the property of Andrews McMill Publishing. So if I want to put anything that has to do with part of the city on my website, I have to ask my editor first. Um, specificity, you have to be like specific. Oh my gosh. Payment terms, make sure you put in pay me by PayPal, pay me by Square, do not pay me by a check. You know, all that information has to be in there because when it comes time for them to pay you and they're like, well, I have this basket of pennies, like, <laughs> it's probably not what you want, you know? So be very clear about how you want to get paid or how you need to pay the person. Um, client and payment information. Client information is also really important because if you're working on a project where there's like two creators, and maybe three people who are funding it, and maybe four people who are on the advisory board, you need to know who you need to report to, you know, because if you're working on a piece of work, and you get this random email, and they're like, we need you to change the color scheme, you may have to do it, even if you have no idea who they are, because they didn't specify who your client actually is, you know, so be very clear about who, who's the people that you're going to be talking to about this. And then also it would be nice to know who they have to report to. Because if they need to report to three other people, that means that you need to work into your schedule how long it's going to take for you to do the work, you know? So um, revisions, um, after a certain amount of revisions, ask for more money. Because, and then also specify what revisions are. Because for me, a revision is, actually, I don't like that hair color. For them, that revision is, I don't like this character at all, you know? So there's a whole, you got to be sure that you know what you mean by revisions. And uh, okay. one yep. more thing uh, that should always be in your contract there, uh, a kill fee. Don't ever, don't ever not put in a kill fee, because if someone gets halfway through the project, and decides, I don't want to do this anymore, they have to have signed something that gets you paid for the work you already put in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And most of the time, you know, you do have to ask for that because most people don't want to put in a kill fee. <laughs> um, there was one point where I was working with a creator and their agent wanted to know if they could put in a contract that the creator will still get paid if they turn in no work at all. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> like, then that gives the creator no incentive to work, you yeah. know? So, you know, that the negotiation process can be very interesting. Um, but kill fees are if work has already been done, <laughs> not if they do nothing. Yeah, um, it just protects you from like, you know, you've done 30 of 60 pages you promised to do and all of a sudden this project is canceled and you spent however many hundred of hours doing it. Right. You should just always get paid for your time. Yeah. Um, okay, copyright. Copyright is, we kind of already talked about it. It's whether you own it or whether someone else owns it. So back to mustache toast, that's my <laughs> copyright. Um, but I have not written it down. So technically, anybody can take mustache toast right now because I have not made it tangible. If I write on my sheet of paper, uh, mustache toast is going to be the thickest TV show and I'm going to run it. And then I draw a little mustache toast. That's, that's my copyright. 
all right? I don't need to put a little C with a circle around it. The second that I make it tangible, whether it's on paper or whether I type it in, then it is mine. Um, who can claim copyright? Anybody. If you created it, you can claim that you have a copyright for it. Um, if you created it with a friend, so let's say Nomi and I made, you know, Mustache Toast 2, the <laughs> son of Mustache Toast. Um, it's still my copyright because I own Mustache Toast, but she created son of Mustache Toast. So we need to have a conversation about who owns what, you know, because you want to make sure that if they make toys of son of and they don't make toys of Mustache Toast Prime, I'm going to be like, well, I should get some money for it, you know, so you definitely want to have that conversation with your co-creator. I know I have written like collaboration contracts before, um, you know, so you have to figure out who owns what. Um, what works are and aren't protected. So um, most things are protected. Um, things that you just throw out into the air, like what if mustache toast, unfortunately you can't protect that because you can't have any proof of it. Um, so if you have proof of it and someone can see it and visualize it and hold it, then it's protected. Um, your protection endures for your entire life plus 70 years, unless they changed it. I'm pretty sure it is still plus 70 years. Disney um, is trying to get that extended. Yes. So that Mickey Mouse does not become public domain. Yes. Disney is, has been trying that. I feel like they've been trying that ever since it was like at the year 50 and they were like, shit, <laughs> we need to... Peanuts is coming up on having to start to try to extend it. Yeah, but see, that's where you can get in transfer of copyright. Um, so you, I can decide that, you know what? My heart just isn't into mustache toast anymore. Uh, I don't want anything to do with it. It reminds me of that argument I got into with Nomi about son of. I just, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. And someone is like, hey, I love mustache toast. And I have an idea for Mustache Toast 3, Rise of Mustache Toast. If you're not doing anything with it, you can absolutely transfer the copyright, but it has to be a written transfer. You cannot just say, yeah, whatever, take it. You have to write it down on something and the, both of you need to sign it. Um, but it doesn't have to be notarized. It doesn't, you don't need to take it to any like court. Um, as long as it's written down, it can be written on a napkin, but as long as it's written down and you both sign it, the transfer has complete. Um, registration. You can register things for your copyright. Um, I don't know where every state does theirs, um, but you can go to this website um, called google.com <laughs> and find out where your local copyright registration building is. Um, you don't have to register everything. Um, I did my comic, um, receiving transmissions. I didn't register that copyright cause I don't have, I don't, I don't feel like it. <laughs> That's pretty much the only reason why it's technically still my copyright, you know, because I created it and my name is on it and I drew it and you can hold it. So the registration is really, if you plan on doing something big with it, if I decide I want to make this into a movie or if I decide I want to sell it, then I need to make sure that I have that registration so that if I get into a situation where I'm worried about the copyright ownership, I'll have that registration. Got it. Okay, taxes. Taxes. Ooh, taxes. <laughs> they are not as scary as you think they are. It is pretty simple. I always say for everything that you get in, put away 30% of it and don't touch it until the end of the year. If that means putting it in a sock, in a safe with five locks, do it. Because at the end of the year, when you do your taxes, because when you're self-employed, you don't take out federal taxes from however much you ask to get paid, you have to pay that back to the government. So if I did a comic and I got paid, you know, a thousand dollars for it, um, the person who uh, paid me does not have to take out federal taxes. So you just get a thousand dollars and you can do with it whatever you want. But at the end of the year, the government's going to be like, Hey, I heard you made a thousand dollars. Where's our cut? You know? So that cut depends on a lot of factors. You could, 
depend on if you're married or um, what your housing situation is. Do you work from home? What are your expenses? There's a lot of things that you find out to really calculate how much you're going to owe, but you should always just put away 30%. Um, a 1099, a miscellaneous form. So this is a form that shows that you got paid for something. So if I drew someone's face for a profile picture and I asked them for $70, I'm not going to do it. They're not going to put a, a, a 1099 miscellaneous form together for that because it's basically between friends. But if you work with a company and they have you draw a face for their logo for $700, because that amount is over $600, they have to write on a 1099 that they paid you $700. So if you get paid over $600, always mark it down so that at the end of the year, you can be like, hey, where's that 1099 form? Because I also need to prove that I received $700 from you. Because when you do your taxes, the person that you did that logo for is going to put into their account that they paid you $700. And because it gets put up into the IRS, the IRS is gonna be waiting for you to say, hey, I got paid from this person. And they have proof of it because they have a 1099 of it. So if you get a 1099 for something, make sure you put away 30% of it and you save the 1099 in a place that is easily, uh, like you can locate it easily. You can print it out and put it in the folder. You can put it in your Google Drive, but it has to be there. Not just because you need it to file your taxes, but you're gonna need it for other things, like to take out a loan. If you wanna buy a house, they are gonna look at your past two years of income. And when they look at your income, they're going to see that you don't work for a company that gives you a W-2, which takes out those taxes ahead of time. You work as a 1099 self-employed person. So they're going to say, okay, well, you work for yourself. Show us that you've been working for yourself for two years. And then you have all these 1099s to be like, here, here's all the work that I did. So it's a really great way to show that you've made money and you're paying taxes on it. Itemizing, record your expenses. Um, What's considered expenses is very wishy-washy. Um, I know some people consider buying comics as an expense because they write comics. You can, I mean, it's professional development. Um, I record any time that I, I have a subscription to Publishers uh, Marketplace, which is a website where I can see all of the book deals that are happening, all of the agents that are doing those deals, and many, many more things. And it's very helpful for my editorial side of my business. So that $25 a month, I expense that because it's a part for work. So just be sure to keep that written. Think about if you work from home, how much you pay for rent. Think about how much you pay for internet. Think about um, if you have a website, how much you pay for your website. Anything that has to do with your business, make sure you write it down and record it because when you do your taxes at the end of the year, they're gonna wanna know because that kind of stuff can get you know, um, deducted, which means you don't have to pay as much. Um, so this is really about my personal VLAA. Um, I know that other VLAAs do this, but basically you can talk to lawyers and they can give you their um, feedback on contracts. There's workshops. Um, there's tax prep workshops. Tax prep though, I have found that in most places, you can only do that if it's not tax season because most of the people that work for VLAA are volunteers. So they're busy <laughs> during tax season because they have jobs. Um, so definitely look, look up you know, what your VLAA does. Awesome. And that is my presentation. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm actually going to be uh, sharing a different screen so that um, you can see what I'm working on currently. Yeah, please. Uh, we have one question about, um, let's first go back to that question about crowdfunding. Okay. Um, this has been so informative, thank you. I was wondering if with the advent of Patreon and Kickstarter and that sort of thing, do you have further insight on the differences in process between traditional publishing and indie crowdsource projects? So what are, what are the benefits and, and pros and benefits of, of crowdfunding versus doing a traditional publishing? Yeah. Well, 
so one of the first benefits is that you have all of the um, power. You know, you can decide how you want to print this book. You can decide how much money this book is going to be. You can, do, you have power over everything, which is a lot of people really want that because when you work with a publisher, it's really kind of up to them to decide. Um, oh, also, Nomi, can you see my, my drawing screen? Yes, I totally Okay, agree. great. It's awesome. Great. Um, so yeah, usually it's up to the publisher to decide a lot of the stuff that goes on when you are um, publishing a book. So if you want to have your own, um, you know, ideas and you want to do it all yourself, I say crowdfunding will be really great. Um, the, <laughs> can you see I'm just making the same line over it's, and over it's again? It's actually making me feel better because I do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what a mess. Um, it's, but, the, it's the blessing and the curse of digital is that you can fuss with things for eternity. Eternity. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, control is where crowdfunding is definitely the, the best part. Um, the downside is everything else is that you have to do everything. You know, you have to worry about shipping. You have to worry about paying your, um, uh, the contributors. Um, you know, I'm in uh, Power and Magic, which is, you know, hosted by Power Magic Press LLC. And Joe, you know, Joe Met, they do all the work for it. And I can't even imagine having to do all that work, you know, having to find all those people and make sure that they're getting paid. I mean, it's a lot of work. And I think that's the downside is that it is a lot of work, <laughs> you know, but um, if you want to do it, go for it. Well, and I think another piece of it is that one of the things that a traditional publisher should provide for you that is a lot of work to do yourself is the promotion and, and kind of selling of, mm -hmm. of the published work. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, there was a point I was talking about in my presentation that, you know, I don't really care to go to conventions. Um, and that's because I don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I mean, I just like, I don't want to have to sell my work. And it is so much easier to have a publisher do it for you. So... But if that's your like bread and butter and you're like, I love, you know, talking to people and getting them excited about this book, totally do self-publishing because publishers aren't actually going to be used to you being like, I'll go to conventions and I'll, I'll you know, I'll really market the book myself. They're not used to that. They, you know, they definitely want to have to do it the way that they're used to doing it, you know? Absolutely. Um, and I, I know you were talking about Patreon as well. Ivy and I used to have a Patreon and it is a lot of work. Um, we did it when we were both um, librarians and this is not a knock against librarians. I loved being a librarian, but I had a lot of fucking free time. <laughs> you know, if no one is asking you a question, you were just sitting there. So, um, you know, we had the time to really put towards having a Patreon. And I think they, they really, really work, especially when you can figure out the different um, the different tiers as well. Um, it, it all, it really adds up. And I mean, we were doing stuff like a podcast and sending stickers in the mail and we were getting like $300 a month, which is like not bad, <laughs> you know, nice. at all. And yeah. so, yeah, I think if you, if you want to, to do that kind of thing, um, you, you totally can. I think, um, Patreon is great. Awesome. Um, there is another question here about um, what is, what are the rules about fan art and um, getting in, can you get in trouble with other people's copyrights by creating fan art? Basically? I mean, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can, it just depends on if they care enough, you know, like if it's something, if so, if you're going to like Emerald City and you're selling stickers of your ship from Voltron, DreamWorks is not going to come to your table and be like, excuse me, cease and desist. It's just not going to happen, you know? So it really depends on the, the size of the fan art that you're doing, you know? Are you selling it as if you own it? Or are you saying that this is, you know, fan work? Like I did Encyclopedia Brown, which is 
not my IP. It is pretty sure Scholastic owns the IP for it currently. And uh, if Scholastic wanted, they could be like, don't sell that. But that's also why I put on the front page, this is not owned by me. It is copyright, you know, Donald Sobol. And um, this is fan art, you know, this is fan work. So while I do make some, you know, money from it, um, I do make sure people understand that this is not my work. Yeah, and the other thing to note there too, I think is, A, if you're not selling it, you can do whatever you want. If it's, yeah. if it's just to like post and get likes on your Instagram, go for it. There's, yeah. there's no uh, legal repercussion there. Um, and it also depends on how big a fish that, um, that IP is. Like I did a zine a while back that was all a tribute to Bruce Springsteen. And like, yeah, Bruce Springsteen could send his lawyers after me and say, don't sell my likeness. But like, Bruce Springsteen doesn't fucking care what I yeah, do. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. If it's uh, like your friend's webcomic and you're selling fan art from your friend's webcomic, that's effed up. Don't do that, <laughs> you know, because they probably want that money from it, not you, you know? Absolutely. Um, we've got one here that says, any advice for artists interested in strip syndication? Uh, no. Unfortunately, I have none. I don't even know how I got into this industry. <laughs> like, I, I have nothing. I mean, I'm still learning. And I was fortunate enough to be reached out to, like an editor came to me and said, do you want to do this strip? And eventually I was like, yes. But when it comes to like pitching a strip, no idea. I don't even know where you would begin. Um, so I would say the first thing you should do is understand how syndication works. Um, so like, for example, Andrews with Meal is a syndication. They take comics like Heart of the City, Peanuts, uh, Cul-de-Sac, um, Stone Soup, all of that. They take those and they sell it to newspapers. So if you want to get a comic in a newspaper, you don't reach out to your local newspaper. You reach out to the syndicate that sells it to them. And then you need to find out if they're looking for new artwork and what their acquisitions process looks like but that's the best that I can give you because other than that I have no idea <laughs> not to like be a Debbie Downer but strips and newspapers have actually dwindled quite a bit as opposed to being like a growing part of the comics industry it's more of a I think it just depends because you think about the book Phoebe and her unicorn that is a strip comic it's not a graphic novel you think about Big Nate that's a strip comic, not a graphic novel. So they're doing perfectly fine. You know, I was, when the, when COVID happened, I was like, yo, are we okay? And she was like, newspapers are essential. We're fine. Um, so keep that in mind as well. While comics are like, you know, purely entertainment, um, strip comics come with a newspaper, which is essential. And they are doing things to make them more relevant, like putting them into graphic novels and selling them. Like Phoebe and her unicorn is on like book 12, you know, that's a, that's a lot. And it's very popular as is Big Nate. So, you know, you can do it. I think you just need to figure out who are the, who are the people that you need to talk to um, and what you actually want to put out there. Because it's another thing, uh, strip comic artists do not retire often because it's a lucrative job like I, mean, I have never had a situation where I was making this kind of money so stably you know so drew a strip through the day after he died yeah I mean the guy who was doing cul-de-sac was turning in stuff like two months before he died so like people don't leave so because of that it makes the onboarding process very difficult for new people because they don't really need an onboarding process. <laughs> they have the same people who've been doing it for decades, you know, but it also makes it harder to want to put more stuff out there because your, your comic is going to have to replace something else. You know, like I just got into my local paper, the post dispatch and it replaced Nancy. And I was like, Nancy, like replace something else. <laughs> like, <laughs> I like reached out to Olivia and I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so you also have to think about that. If a newspaper is going to pick it up, it's because 
they something have else something booted. else is gonna get booted you know something that isn't as popular I, mean, I, can, I just true. cannot believe that nancy isn't as popular in post dispatch i don't know what made them decide to do that <laughs> Hilarious, but I mean, honestly, how many more Beatle Baileys do we need to see? Or, <laughs> but I know. I, I'm not. I, I do love Beetle Bailey, but <laughs> I've been reading it I, since I was I like, I can live the rest of my life without Beetle Bailey or Blondie again. But yeah, but you'd be surprised. Some people can't. <laughs> I mean, Peanuts is still going. It's just yeah. second or third. Uh, we haven't gotten through a whole 50 years again yet. But we're getting there. Uh, Matt wants to know if you could talk to us a little bit about your drawing process while you're drawing it. Oh, sure. Yeah. So I'm using Clip Studio, which is great. It's basically Photoshop for comic artists. Um, and I had, had used Photoshop for like my entire life. <laughs> I mean, I remember like being like 10 years old and playing on Photoshop. So like, I know Photoshop like the back of my hand. Um, and I switched over to Clip Studio like seamlessly because some of the shortcuts are the same, you know? And there's just like a lot of different stuff on there that's just like better for comics. You know, things just, it just makes it easier, you know? So I, I like Clip Studio. Um, but so what I actually do for this strip, um, you can actually, I'll show you. I'll turn off this layer, put this back up to 100, and turn on that. OK, so this was the rough that I sent to my, my editor. You can kind of see who is who, mostly by like their hairstyles or their face shape, you know, this is very clearly hard, you know? I did decide not to have her wear her jacket because apparently uh, people are annoyed that she wears her jacket all the time. Like what? <laughs> anyway. Do you get uh, reader feedback like that? Yes, it's awful. It is so awful. She got what earrings you... and people are like, how come she's not wearing her earrings today? I'm like, what? do you wear earrings every day? Like, <laughs> please. I, I just wanna know like who's taking the time to get so angry about something they saw in a grandparents comic writing to the editor <laughs> grandparents i'm telling you 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 will be able to find it i was looking through heart of the city old stuff and i'm like most of the people on here are like oh she reminds me of my grandchild i'm like is this the, the audience <laughs> is, is this my audience yes that's that's my audience so hopefully my my audience has um expanded a bit more so that these jokes are landing a bit better, but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the, this is the, the rough that I send, um, and so I put it into the, uh, the page of, you know, two by six, whatever, um, then I make these panels with this guide, which is really, really helpful, and then, uh, that is how I get my borders, um, then I go in and I lower the opacity on the original because I need to know basically where they need to stand, but most of the, mostly I'm, I'm going to be drawing for, you know, it's going to be new. Um, so I did the illustration, I drew it here and here, and then I just copied and pasted and put this one over here. Um, there's a lot of copy and pasting. I got to do 365 strips a year. I'm copying and pasting as much as I can. Um, I just don't have the time. I mean, this is why I'm doing a strip while I'm doing a, a presentation. I, I <laughs> have no time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do the pencils and then I get rid of that layer. And then I do the, um, the dialogue. Um, because I want to make sure that it all fits. That's another thing. It has to be a certain size because when it gets printed in a newspaper, it's going to be relatively small. So I have to make sure I actually have enough space for everything. Um, and then once the, the spacing is figured out, then um, I get rid of it and I start inking. And I always put this down to like 25%. That way I can actually see my inks better. Um, and then eventually, once I'm finished with that, um, I shade it. So let's see, if I'll open up the last one. This should be good, yeah. 
So once it's inked, then I move it over to a new file and I make the black lines, which I straight up didn't do. Whoops. Okay, <laughs> so I have to convert it so that it's pure black and white monochrome so that when it prints, it prints purely black. Uh, whoops. <laughs> Yeah, the department would have let me know. They were like, um, this one isn't completely right. And I'd be annoyed. <laughs> um, so then I set this later multiply and I picked the shading color, which I have for my master sheet here, which I always have open. Um, this master sheet has the character illustrations, the colors, the what size point brush I use for how many people is in a strip, the copyright, but here's the 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 shading colors. So I, I, I picked up the shading color and then I shade it and then um, it's done. And then I save it as a TIFF and I, and I upload it to, uh, to the server. Um, this is for September 25th. So that's how far ahead wow. I draw. Um, it, you, they really want you to be about four weeks ahead for dailies and about th two or three weeks ahead for Sundays. And I'm trying to be six weeks ahead on everything because I don't want to get in a situation where I have an emergency and I have to draw during my emergency, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So or that maybe you want to take a vacation someday when vacation yes. again? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so yeah, <laughs> but that's, that is how I do those. Awesome. We are just about out of time here. We got uh, a good question to end on. This is, oh, and Dino thinks it's time for dinner. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, this last one is really broad. Uh, how do you feel the current, how do you feel the current state of the comics industry is? Great. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> I mean, okay, so you know, we've got like issues with like comics gate there's that um there's always going to be issues with predators i'm sorry i'm not positive you know ab about thinking that's ever going to end but you know it, it won't <laughs> um but other than that i actually think things are going really well because we're actually seeing so many new creators and seeing the kinds of stories that i wish i had when i was younger you know um everything from these adaptations of like the Babysitter's Club to books like El Defo, which like I know isn't that new anymore, but um, you know, I wish I had a story that talked about people who were, you know, hearing impaired because I went to school with people who are hearing impaired and I didn't learn anything about that, you know? So I, I think it's really great that um, there are more um, publishers that are, taking the opportunities to really get into graphic novels and understanding that graphic novels are a great medium. And it's not just a great medium for, for teaching, but it's a great medium for reading. It's just, you know, it's all over really awesome. And I'm, I'm glad that people are finally getting, you know, paid to be making these graphic novels. I mean, I'm very fortunate to be getting, you know, paid a living wage to, you know, draw Heart of the City for, um, you know, hopefully 20 years and then I retire, you know, so um, I think it's, it's going really, really well. I think the only thing that I do worry about is the direct market. And I think that's because the traditional book market is, is just like booming when it comes to graphic novels. And I think we saw even with COVID, you know, that there's clearly uh, a, a monopoly going on with the distribution of, of single issue comics with who gets to sell comics, who gets to make comics, and I think the direct market could really um, make some changes. And I, I think those changes are being made from different publishers that are starting up to, you know, making a standard, you know, comic book script. You know, I, I think that's just one of the things we have to, to think about is if we want this industry to grow and, 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 and stay relevant, we need to, to make some changes and we need to actually um make it more legitimate we need standards <laughs> so i think we're getting there and I, I think the the industry is still booming and i'm hoping that you know people like me and you know know me and the entire like cca crew like they're doing the right thing by ushering in new students 
because if you don't have new creators, the industry is just going to die, you know? So I think we're off on a, on a good track. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steens. This has been really, really great info. And I'm sure everyone, uh, I hope everyone screenshotted all of your um, contract points there. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I hope no one screenshotted my uh, comics since they're not out yet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so, so much for visiting with our students yeah, and everybody who joined us tonight. Um, this has just been, a, a, I think, a really great lesson for everybody, but also just an opportunity to really admire your work, which we're just, I mean, the thing about, you know, teaching comics and running a comics program, when it all comes down to it, we're, we're fans, and, and uh, we're huge fans of your work, and we just uh, hope to see more and more and more of it. Justin, any final words as we close uh, out the... Uh, covering so many different aspects of, of making yeah. comics and having a life as a cartoonist, which I think we get we get kind of lost in the weeds of, of mm. the, the beauty of the art form and kind of forget, okay, all right, how do we how do we make a life around this? And yeah. Uh, yeah, shining a light on that. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. And Naomi, thank you so much for being the host and the interviewer tonight. Um, so we, we have this bonus webinar coming up on September 4th where our students will be presenting their work. We'll have more of that on social media here soon. Um, but it's been a great summer and uh, this is a fantastic way to finish things up. Thank you so much to everybody. We're going to shut it down tonight and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, hopefully, for that uh, the grad reading. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.